beautiful, beautiful words. And praise God for each one who can say, Jesus fully saves me now with a full and free and uttermost salvation. Returning in God's word to Matthew chapter 5 as we continue our study on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. It's been a few weeks since we've been in this passage, but we certainly are glad to be back in it again. Matthew chapter 5, just a short reading, but it's important. It is the word of God, Matthew 5 and verse 17. And the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is speaking. He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the, these least commandments, and shall teach men also, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, <clears throat> ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for this word. Lord, we pray you will open it to us today, give us an understanding to know exactly what it is, Lord, you're telling us. Lord, we don't want man's opinion, we want God's truth. And therefore, we ask thee, Lord, that above the voice of man today, the Lord will speak. We pray, Lord, that we'll hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Bless each waiting heart, we pray. Take away all distractions, Lord. We know how easily in a message that people can be distracted. But we pray that they'll be focused today on the person, the work of Christ. We ask you, Lord, that you'll just help us to understand. And Lord, more than this, Lord, not just to understand with a head knowledge, but to obey within our hearts. Oh, Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to, Lord, preach the word as I was given. Empty me of self and sin. May God be glorified. Fill me with thy spirit, I pray. And honor thy son through the preaching of thy word, I ask in Jesus' name, for his glory alone. Amen and amen. In this sermon so far, starting in Matthew chapter 5, we have considered the Beatitudes, verses 3 down to verse 12. And then... The purpose of the Christian in verses 13 down to verse number 16. And the purpose of the Christian, of course, is to be salt and light in this world. Now, this teaching was in many ways radical teaching. And as a result, it could have been that people around were maybe thinking that the Lord Jesus was coming to try and do away with everything that they had ever learnt before. And therefore, he settles this matter by saying, Think not, verse 17, that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What are the law and the prophets? Well, the law and the prophets are simply an Old Testament or a New Testament way of speaking about the Old Testament. The law and the prophets. Basically, the law summarized the first five books of the Bible Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Uh, numbers in Deuteronomy, and then the rest is called prophets. Now, we know there's poetry within that. We know there are proverbs within that and many things. But generally speaking, in the New Testament, whenever the Lord Jesus Christ or whenever one of the apostles or Paul writes about the law and the prophets, which they do in various places, well, they're speaking about the Old Testament. So why were people making this accusation against the Lord? Why did they think he was coming to destroy the Old Testament? Well, there are a few reasons for this. Firstly, because of the Lord's behavior regarding some of the commandments of the law, because of his behavior and because of his teaching. For example, the Sabbath. Now, on the Sabbath day, the Jews had many rules and regulations, scores more than there ever were put down in the law of Moses. They added certain things about how far you could walk on the Sabbath day and how far you could travel over water and what exactly you could do and what exactly you couldn't do. And all of those things were made to be very strict laws and it brought a great bondage. Now on the Sabbath day, you know that the Lord healed the man with a withered hand. And here's the Lord doing a miracle. Here's the Lord doing something good. Here's the Lord doing something that helps and that heals. 
And the men who saw him, the scribes and the Pharisees, were angry because they believed that he was breaking the Sabbath. What was the Lord Jesus Christ doing? The Lord was showing that they had made the Sabbath into something that it was never, ever meant to be. The Sabbath was not meant to be a day of bondage where you have to keep a certain amount of laws, but the Sabbath was to be a day of freedom where you didn't have to do the things that you get to do the rest of the week. And the work that wasn't of necessity or mercy could be left aside. And you could relax and you could rest and you come into God's presence and God's house and to worship him. But the Pharisees then, that exposed the, how ridiculous their laws were. And of course they were angry at him. And perhaps the accusation had been made against the Lord. He's coming to destroy everything from the Old Testament. Maybe his thoughts regarding uncleanness. Now, there were laws in the Old Testament about uncleanness. If somebody had a disease or a running sore or an issue of blood or something like that, there were commands given on how to approach that person, the fact that they shouldn't be touched, etc., in case there was contamination. But these simply were hygiene laws. They were taken to an absolute extreme in the New Testament. And not only that, they were added to. And basically... This law of uncleanness started to become a law where the Pharisees looked down upon anybody that wasn't like them. And they considered them unclean and they didn't want to be near them. And they walked away from them and separated themselves from them. That's why it was so shocking when the Lord came and sat among the harlots and the publicans. That's why it was so shocking when the Lord touched the leper because of the laws of uncleanness. And maybe they were accusing him of trying to take away the Old Testament. Another reason why they might have accused the Lord of trying to destroy the law and the prophets was because the Lord's teaching was so different from the religious leaders. You know, they were claiming to honor the Old Testament, but they just simply produced more and more laws and said, well, this is what we see out of the law of Moses. And they add it and add it and add it to it. The Lord brought it down to the basics where the everyday individual person could understand it. The common people heard him gladly because he spoke simply and clearly and plainly. And that's the way it needs to be when we're presenting the word of God. And it seemed a completely different message from what the religious establishment of Israel were teaching at that time. Of course, what the Lord teaches is in perfect harmony with the Old Testament. One thing we have to notice before we go any further is this, that the Lord used the Old Testament in his preaching. The Lord referred to many of the books of the Old Testament. He quoted them, and because he quoted them, and because he obeyed them and revealed himself through them, that shows us that the Lord believed that the Old Testament was applicable not only for his day, but still for today. Because the Old Testament reveals Christ, It shows our need of being rescued from a broken law and it teaches us how to live a life that honours the Lord when we're saved. So let's look at this verse again. It says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't come to destroy what God had already given and established as his word. But rather he said he had come to fulfil it. Now there are three types of law in the Old Testament. There is a ceremonial law, and that was to do with Jewish worship. And that was to do with uh, the sacrifices and the temple system. And that was the ceremonial law. Then there was the civil law. And that was to do with just daily life in Israel. And simply it showed you how to live with one another. But then there was the moral law. And we've read the summary of the moral law in the Ten Commandments today. Now, which law was the Lord Jesus Christ speaking about when he said, I am come to fulfill? Well, we believe it was the moral law. Why? Because if you read on down after where we stopped, it says in verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. Verse number 27. Thou, you've heard it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adult, adultery. And he goes down through some of the moral law and he brings this out to show them what it really means. Do you know you can take some scripture and put your own interpretation upon it and come up with a wrong conclusion? 
The Lord Jesus Christ took the moral law and presented it before the people to show them clearly and exactly what it meant. You know, the ceremonial law no longer applies to us today. Because, you see, the ceremonial law was all about pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every sacrifice, even every object in the temple and the, and the tabernacle before it, they were simply symbols and shadows that pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that the Lord Jesus Christ is here, we don't have to bring an animal to sacrifice to look forward to Calvary. Now that the Lord Jesus Christ is here, we don't have to have certain symbols in our church the Lord Jesus Christ is here and we look back to the work that he has done in Calvary and we praise him that not only has he come to this earth and done the work that's necessary to save us, but he dwells within us by his Holy Spirit. So that ceremonial law is no longer, but the moral law has never been done away with because the Lord Jesus Christ establishes it through his teaching in the New Testament. See, there's some people say, well, that's just Old Testament stuff. I'm a New Testament Christian. I only have to believe, sorry, believe what's in the New Testament. No, you have to believe what God has revealed in his entire word from Genesis through to Revelation. Now, those ceremonial parts of scripture and those parts that speak the ceremonial law, while they no longer apply for today in our worship, they're very profitable for our study because they show us Christ. They preach Christ to us. So what should the Christian's attitude be to the moral law of God? The Ten Commandments, the things that the Lord commands us to do in Scripture. What should our attitude be to them? Is it, well, I'm saved and, you know, I can't lose my salvation, so I do whatever I want. No. Our attitude to the moral law should be this. God's law, the moral law, the Ten Commandments, the instructions God gives us in his word for daily living, they are perfect, perfect, pure and holy because they're God's. Remember what I said at the very start of a reading earlier on, God spoke. God said these words. God has spoken to this world and he's given his standards of what is right and what is wrong, what is holy, what is unholy. And they're still the same today. Not only that, our attitude should be, as Christians, the moral law of God is necessary to live in a way that reveals him to the world in our lives. If we want to show Christ in our lives and prove that there is a Savior, the best way we can do that is by living holy lives, by living Christ-like lives. How do you do that? Do you get up in the morning and say, well, I feel this is right, I feel that's right, I feel this is wrong, that's wrong. No, you come to the word of God and it shows you what's right and it shows you what's wrong. The great problem today is many people do throw the word of God away and they make their decisions on how to live as a Christian based on what they feel. Remember what the word of God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. Not only that, our attitude to the law should be, it's a privilege to walk close to the Lord. It's a privilege for me to go down the Ten Commandments. It's a privilege for me to go to God's Word here in Matthew 5 and different parts of God's Word and say, well, what does the Lord say to me? I am the light of the world. Well, I must make a point in my life of doing all I can to shine for Christ. It's a privilege. It's a high calling. Not only that, but it's a great blessing. The Christian's attitude to the law of God ought to be this. It's a blessing to me. Why? Because it saves me from many heartaches and many consequences of sin. And I'm sure, like me, you will know that if you look back over your life, there are many times that things have happened in your life and they've been disappointing and you've been hurt and all of those things. But it wasn't because of other people. It was because you and I broke the laws of God. There are consequences for breaking the laws of God. But I'll tell you, when you walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Why we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all he will trust and obey. And praise God for a heart that loves the Lord and the word of God and desires to walk in his commandments. But not only that, is it perfect, it's necessary, it's a privilege, it's a blessing. But I want to tell you this, the law of God is possible. It is possible to live the law of God by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, of course, um, we're not going to be perfect. We're going to break it day and daily in thought, word, and deed. 
But there is power in the Spirit of God to help us to live and fulfill the law of God even in our hearts to his glory. Now, something else we notice here. So the Lord has not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Now, that's important too. Because in fulfilling the law of God, he shows a perfect righteousness. If the Lord Jesus Christ had broken one part of the law of God, it would have been deemed broken in all parts. But that was not even possible because the very character of God is immutable. It's impossible for God to sin. And praise God for that, because that means we have a perfect Savior who's fully kept the law. And only a perfect man could die on the cross for sinners. And praise the Lord, it was the God-man, Christ Jesus. He was the only one who could bear another's sin because he had no sin of his own to bear before his Father. Look at verse number 18. It says, For verily I say unto you, and interestingly, the word verily, while it does mean truly, and when the Lord says verily, verily, it means truly, truly, this particular word that's being translated verily is the word amen. Amen. So what does the Lord Jesus Christ give his amen to? For I say unto you, amen, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The jot speaks of the smallest of the Hebrew letters. It's the jot. And it's the smallest letter. It's just a little marking. And it seems small. It's maybe insignificant. But every part of the law is important. Now, while the jot is small, the tittle is even smaller. And it is simply just a little stroke. But that little stroke can make a huge difference in the word in Hebrew. By just a little stroke barely seen, just like a little horn coming out of the letter, that can change the name Sarah to Sarai. And it can change a name and make it mean something completely different. Just this little stroke. You see, every part of the law of the Lord is important. He has given the law completely. He has given it certainly. He has given it clearly. And what was the purpose of the giving of this law? It was to show sinners their need of a saviour by revealing the standard of perfect righteousness. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ himself summarized the law, and we'll be coming to this in future days, that the summary of the law is to love the Lord by God with all thy heart and to love your neighbour as yourself. Now look at this verse. It says, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. And what this is saying is simply this. There will never be a time in earth or heaven when God's law ceases to be the revealed will and character of God and also the way God desires his people to live. Now, when we get to heaven, we will be able to perfectly keep the moral law of God. The fact will be it will be impossible for us to break the law of God in heaven because we'll be made like our Savior. We will be perfect and pure. But you see, today, there is a desire within man to tamper with the law of God from various angles. They do different things. For example, some people like the Pharisees try to add to the law to make further laws to bring man into bondage. Now, there are many principles in God's word, and there are certain laws that cannot be Negotiate it. But what an awful thing whenever people start to bring in extra laws and bring them into the same uh, standing as the law of God. Bring them into the same standing of, as the law of God. It happened in the New Testament. There were Judaizers and they said, well, you can only be saved if you're trusting in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? And as long as you're circumcised, they add it to the law of God. Do you know there are some churches today, and well, while some might preach it, some certainly live it. You can only be saved and on your way to heaven and certain of heaven if you're washed in the blood of the Lamb and you belong to our denomination. What's that heresy? What utter bondage? What heresy? What wickedness. We dare not add laws to the word of God. It's perfect. It's complete. It's true. God's law gives us freedom. 
Freedom to worship him. Freedom to worship him within the confines of God's word. Freedom to worship him in the fact that we're not dead in sin anymore, but we're alive in Christ. Now, that's the way some people tamper with the law of God, but some people tamper in another way. They try and they take away from it. And some people will turn around and say, well, that verse isn't necessary for today. Or you have to remember that they were living in different times, so that wouldn't be applicable for today. It's not acceptable today to have such a law upon a society as that because, well, we've moved on and we're not living in the past. And sometimes the church is called ancient, sometimes preachers are called old-fashioned, sometimes Christians are called just uh, dinosaurs, basically, because they will not just leave what God has given and come into the modern era and the modern time. And then there are others, and this is a very dangerous thing as well, who try and say that some parts of the law of God are more important than others. Do you remember what the Lord said? Not one jot or tittle will pass because they're all important. So you can't go down the Ten Commandments and list them in order and say, well, that's more important than that one and that's more important than that one and oh, that would be the least important. You wouldn't have to worry about that one so much. No, they're all the law of God. And we're very good at compartmentalizing things and thinking, well, this is important, this isn't important. If God says it's, it's important, full stop. If God has declared it, we have to obey it. Basically, what this verse is saying is this. God's law, God's word is the standard. Until all shall be fulfilled. Whenever that statement, all shall be fulfilled, that's speaking about the birth, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, until the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, God's word stands. And that's what that verse is saying. One of the gospel songs says, God's still God. Sin's still sin. And the blood of Christ is still the only way for us to come to him. And God's word's still true. Each book, each page, I'm glad that some things never change. God's word doesn't change. And isn't it great to know that there is a standard, there is a rule, there is a divine decree that tells me what's right and wrong? Isn't it great to know I can know what is righteousness and what is wickedness? I'm not living my life based on some interpretation of what's right and wrong by some fallible man or woman. I'm living by the word of God. And I trust you are too. Just because the government says something's right does not mean it's right. If the government commands something that is against the law of God, it's the duty of the Christian not to obey the government. But if the government have a rule and a command that does not break the law of God, whether you like it or not, you must obey because that's the word of God. So for example, if they raise your taxes and you're not very happy about it, well, you're under duty and according to the word of God to pay those taxes because that's your civil duty. But if they tell you not to worship God or they say that you can't meet together to have a prayer meeting or you can't tell others about your religion, well, we cannot obey that because God's word says go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But if it is within the confines of God's word and if it's not going to cause you to sin then you must obey those who have rule over you you know we need to be spiritual about such matters we often see other people breaking the law of God don't we well they're doing that and the Bible says you shouldn't be doing it they're not doing that and the Bible says you should be doing it and folks we sometimes, in our looking at other people, sin within ourselves. How? Well, when we see somebody maybe breaking the law of God, a brother and sister in Christ, maybe the first thing we feel is resentment towards them. Maybe you start to talk about them and not to them. Maybe we just write them off and cut them off and assume God can't use them because of what they're doing. And friend, in those three things, we are sinning. 
No child of God should have resentment towards another. No child of God should be talking about the sins of another. No child of God should be writing anybody off and assume God can't use them. You're not God. What an unspiritual, immature, and sinful behavior. Now, if you see another brother or sister falling or failing or sinning, you remember what the law of God is. Summarized briefly by the Lord, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and love your neighbor as yourself. This is your duty. So therefore, if you see a brother or sister falling or sinning or backsliding, what practically ought you to do as a Christian in a spiritual manner? Well, number one is you pray for that person. Not against them, but for them. And if one half of the time spent talking to others would be spent talking to the Lord, perhaps that person would be restored more quickly. The second thing is this. We need to speak to that person if it's necessary, or you're led to do so, in love and in humility. You see, there's a different difference between coming wagging, you're doing that wrong. Brother, look, I'm concerned about something that I see in your life and I just want to leave it with you and share what it is. There's a difference. Humility and love go a long way in winning a brother or sister for the Lord. No arrogance, no haughtiness, no I know better than you. Humility. And then the third thing is this, encourage that person. Encourage them into the into fellowship with the Lord again. Don't ignore them. Don't ostracize them. Love them. Friend, this is a work of God. And you might say, well, what if they don't? What if they don't come back to the Lord? What if they don't stop sinning? Well, hold on. We don't know what's going to happen. And it's not for us to ask questions and make scenarios. What if, what if, what if? That's not our responsibility. We don't know how this will turn out. But what if you're the one that the Lord wants to use to bring them back to himself? What if you're the one that the Lord wants to use to bring them back into service? Your duty is to love them as yourself. Friend, as yourself. You treat others the way you want to be treated, and that's what the Word of God says. In fact, um, in Matthew 7, 12, Therefore all things, whatever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. For this is the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. And we need to think of our actions sometime and think, well, put myself in that situation. If I have fallen, if I've sinned, how would I want someone coming to me? Would I want them coming with a big stick, beating me over the head, saying how awful I am? Or want them coming in love, trying to restore me? Let's be spiritual about these matters. Let's not be Pharisees. Let's not be hypocrites. Let's be spiritual. Then very quickly, verse 19 says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments... And shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You see, sometimes the Pharisees split the law into the least and the greatest. But they lived their lives that way as well. And there were times whenever the Pharisees would overlook a certain law and it didn't really matter if they got their own way. We think about the trial and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a complete breaking of the law from start to finish. But what this scripture is saying is this. If there is a Christian who in foolishness is breaking the command of God and telling others he should be called the least in the kingdom of God. In other words, he will lose his respect for the position that he holds. And you know, there are people today, and yes, they're saved, but they're teaching wrong truths. Now, they do not lose their salvation, but they lose the respect of the office which they hold. Whenever a minister stands in the pulpit and says, well, you can go and drink socially, or you can live together even if you're not married, that's wrong. He loses respect in the office in which he is and he will be of no effect in the advancement of the kingdom of God. But for the one who preaches and obeys, they'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven. They're not the greatest because the Lord is the greatest, 
But the Lord uses those who not only share the gospel, but those who live the gospel. And that's the most effective witness and testimony to have, not just to simply preach the gospel, but to live the gospel. A holy life backs up God's precious word. And that's why it shows us how dangerous it is for us to start putting our interpretation on the law. We're simply to preach the whole counsel of God, as thus and thus saith the Lord, and to obey it. And the final thing I want to leave with you, and our time's away, verse 20, it says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Lord is not saying that the scribes and the Pharisees were spiritually righteous. But it is a fact that is recorded in Scripture and also in his history that the Pharisees did live outwardly upright lives. In many aspects, they were admired by others in society. But that was an outward righteousness. And the Bible says that if we're not saved, even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. You see, there's only one way to enter the kingdom of heaven, the family of God and the church of Jesus Christ, and it is a complete righteousness. And I want to say three simple things as we finish today. First of all, perfect righteousness is always accepted by God. Do you remember whenever the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was baptized? Do you remember whenever the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was transfigured? At both those times, the Lord God spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son. I am well pleased. Hear ye him. This is my beloved Son. There was acceptance for Christ because he was perfectly righteous. Now, if you and I stand before God in our sin, there's no acceptance. It's depart from me, I never knew you. It's hell for all eternity because we have no righteousness that makes us acceptable before God. And I want to say, secondly, perfect righteousness is not possible for the sinner because the Bible says all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. If you're sitting here this morning thinking somehow you can please God with the life that you live and that will be acceptable to God as your entrance into heaven, I want to tell you, you're sure to be in hell. Because the Bible says all have sinned, young and old. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why perfect righteousness is accepted by God, perfect righteousness is not possible for the sinner. But my final thought is this. Perfect righteousness is offered to all as the gift of God. In Jeremiah 23 and verse 6, it says, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell in safety. And this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah said, can you? The Lord our righteousness. Are you able to say this morning, he is the Lord my righteousness? Are you able to leave this house this morning saying, my hope is in Christ? My eternity is in Christ. My ability and power is in Christ. He is my righteousness. If you're not saved this morning, then what you need to do is bow your head and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I know I have nothing that makes me acceptable in thy sight, but I thank the Lord that there's a perfect righteousness, that of Christ. And I pray this morning that I'll be washed in the blood that he shed. And I pray that his righteousness will become mine. And I'll be covered with that righteousness. And I'll be brought into the covenant of grace. And I will know for sure this morning that I'm saved. Friend, that's all that matters in life. How often do we stand in this pulpit, read out a list of names each Lord's day of those who pass from death or into death. Someday my name will be read from here. Someday your name will be read from here. And all that matters is this. That the person who died was able to say, The Lord, my righteousness. Friend, if that's not your testimony today, then I beg you, come to Christ. And if you're saved, then you go to the word of God and you get excited to see what God will command his people to do. And you do it with all your heart. And you know what you'll know? The blessing of God upon you. For no good thing will he withhold from them 
that walk uprightly. Friend, if it's not in Scripture, it's not of God. But there's principles for every area of our life. The law of God is not destroyed. But praise God, it's fulfilled. And not only fulfilled in Christ, but explained. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of these things that the Lord has said. And how we can live for him in these areas of our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee and praise thee for the word of God this morning. We thank you, Lord, that there is a living Savior. And Lord, that while we are under the law and condemned under the law, once we're saved, then we have the privilege to keep that law and to live by that law. Lord, it's our delight to live close to thee. And I pray this morning that each one in this gathering will first of all know Christ as their righteousness and as their Savior. And then, Lord, live according to the revealed will of God. Surely this is a way of blessing. O God, grant it today, we pray. Give grace, we ask. Help to choose for Christ. May God be glorified in the results of this meeting, we ask in Jesus' name, for his glory alone. Amen.